It's really great to be with you uh, tonight to talk about uh, uh, the book, The Painters of the Wasatch uh, Mountains. I wanted to thank uh, Robin for uh, making this possible. And uh, I also want to uh, thank Ann Brahick for the outstanding work she did uh, uh, putting the exhibit together. She's uh, uh, in charge of exhibitions here, and uh, so thank you. And uh, Katie Eldridge, who dealt with the uh, media uh, outreach, and I really appreciate the work that she's done. And others here at the Kimball Arts Center, thank you very much for uh, making this uh, uh, possible tonight. So what I wanted to start with was um, how the idea for the book came to be. I was uh, the founding director of the Museum of Utah Art and History, a museum that we started downtown, but uh, because of the changes in, uh, uh, in direction uh, with uh, what's happening downtown, the Museum of Utah Art and History is now ma mainly an online service uh, that we provide um, and access for uh, teachers and others to get uh, uh, access to works of art in places all over the state. Uh, and we could talk more about that later, but uh, what, it was a great thrill uh, to be able to um, work with uh, officials, uh, particularly from uh, museums, uh, uh, people with private collections of Utah art uh, and uh, uh, others uh, in the state of Utah uh, and to get to know them and to get a sense of the very rich tradition of Utah art. Now part of the responsibility of a director is to raise money, right? <laughs> Robin knows about that. Anybody who's the head of a nonprofit uh, is always trying to figure out, well, how can we raise uh, money to help our enterprise? So I, uh, I worked with a number of people who were generous and made some great donations uh, uh, for the museum. And uh, one of the people that I approached was a friend uh, uh, of ours, uh, the chief operating officer uh, of uh, Wasatch Advisors, uh, a small cap uh, investment fund uh, located here, domiciled here in Utah. And Part of their brand uh, image is uh, the Wasatch. And if you go to their offices downtown near uh, Social Hall Avenue, uh, there are paintings of the Wasatch uh, that are distributed throughout the halls and the offices uh, of, uh, of the people at Wasatch Advisors. So I, I thought I was a natural. I went to John and I said, Wouldn't, won't you uh, or could you not help us uh, with a donation from the firm? And he said, well, we don't make donations uh, as a firm. Each of the partners does their own philanthropy. So let's think a little more about how we might, uh, you know, make this uh, work for us at Wasatch Advisors and how it could work for you uh, at the museum. And so we, uh, we discussed it uh, for a while and we determined that uh, each year Wasatch Advisors Advisors sent out a year-end gift of uh, fruit and uh, and uh, other kinds of uh, things, a basket to their top uh, clients around the country and really around the world uh, because they distribute their funds uh, worldwide. And so uh, uh, we said, well, why don't we think about that? And John said, you know, it would be fantastic if we could do some sort of uh, book. Uh, that we could use as a year-end gift at Wasatch Advisors and would fit into our brand as an organization and uh, would be, uh, you know, would get the, uh, uh, reinforce uh, the importance of, of, of painters of the Wasatch Mountains, which they themselves as an organization actually uh, have, um, are really supported through the years. Uh, and uh, so, I went to um, I went to um, see uh, the 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 master of uh, Utah art, uh, Robert Alpin, Bob Alpin, at the University of Utah, the former dean of fine arts, uh, a name that many of you probably know well, and uh, he uh, has has a series on uh, PBS 
on Utah art that uh, I think still may be shown. Great person uh, and uh, a wonderful uh, person. And uh, so I said to Bob, you know, I think it would be terrific if we had, uh, if we could put together a, a book on the Wasatch, uh, painters of the Wasatch uh, Mountains. Has a book like this been done? You know? And uh, he looked at me and he said, no, and it's a book I've always wanted to write. <laughs> and he said, you know, this is needed. It's a, it's a gap, actually, in, uh, in art, uh, art history not to, have such a, not to have such a work. And so I said, well, Bob, let's uh, go back and talk to John about this. And uh, John, of course, was delighted uh, that we could take uh, this uh, approach. And then uh, we needed a publisher. So we went to uh, see a couple of people, but the clear, uh, the clear answer to who should publish this book uh, was Gib Smith. Uh, and uh, Shudley Ombi is here, here tonight, I guess representing the family. Uh, <laughs> her brother is Gibbs Smith. And Gibbs uh, has published these wonderful books through the years on Utah art, and so it was a perfect uh, collaboration. And he said, yeah, I'm in. I'd be uh, very, you know, uh, delighted to, you know, to publish uh, this uh, book. And so Utah, so Wasatch Advisor said, well, uh, you know, we'll, we'll pay for the publishing of the book if we can get uh, 1,500 copies ourselves, uh, and then you can use, uh, you can do what you want with the other, uh, we published 5,000 copies, so that left uh, 3,500 copies that we could uh, sell for the benefit of the museum, uh, which turned out to be really helpful for uh, some of our education programs uh, that we were trying to generate. So it was a win for Wasatch Advisors because it helped in the end with uh, their brand and reinforcing their brand. It was a win for, for uh, the museum uh, because it reinforced uh, our mission, uh, which is to uh, have uh, people of Utah appreciate uh, their heritage, their visual artistic uh, heritage, and it actually filled an academic uh, gap. And what was that gap? Well. Fundamentally, and this was uh, part of the, uh, what I brought to the project, uh, having a background in art history, um, what, uh, was uh, the argument that the Hudson River School really goes west. Uh, that the Hudson River School painters who use the Hudson River Valley as their subject matter for generations, uh, we now have even some of those artists coming west and depicting uh, the Wasatch Mountains, uh, Alfred Bierstadt being uh, a, a prime example, and we have some of his works of, uh, that he did and inspired those early first generation uh, Utah artists to uh, paint uh, uh, the, uh, the mountains. So that's the story of how the uh, book came to be and how it reinforced uh, a need uh, for, uh, for, uh, uh, for, in, uh, for getting the message out that Utah has a tremendous visual uh, heritage. And I guess I would say that one of the things that, that uh, many people I've talked to uh, from all around the country who, who visit Utah are surprised at the uh, you know, visual, heritage, uh, visual arts heritage in, in Utah. So, what I thought I'd do tonight is to kind of then build on this um, idea, uh, this you know, cultural history, really, of uh, the visual arts in Utah, and talk a little bit about uh, some of the artists here and how they fit into that, uh, into that picture. So, when you come into the exhibit, painting by John Hafen of uh, Mount uh, Timpanogos, and it's a, it's a beautiful painting, uh, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very luminous in the way that it's uh, painted. It, it uh, uses aerial uh, uh, perspective, and it's very, has a very atmospheric uh, feel uh, to the way that it's uh, painted. Uh, and just as an aside, speaking of atmospherics, uh, 
Uh, did you hear about the um, uh, group of artists, uh, Robin, who uh, uh, thought that or decided to uh, build uh, to start a gallery on the moon? It was great location, but no atmosphere. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> back to the uh, <laughs> back to the. Uh, what was I talking about? <laughs> uh, so John Hafen uh, was one of those early artists who, you know, painted the Wasatch. And what gave him inspiration to do that? Or what gave him the means uh, to do that? What, what uh, gave him the impulse uh, to uh, paint this subject? Well, clearly, there were painters that had come before. Uh, and we have some examples of those uh, uh, here uh, that uh, Haven would, would know. Uh, uh, HLA uh, uh, Cullimer here, you know, Harry Cullimer was a very fine Utah artist in the Bierstadt tradition. Much more emphasis on line and uh, linear uh, sort of uh, approach to painting than, uh, than Haven. Uh, but uh, even notwithstanding their contrast, uh, they inspired, uh, you know, one another's uh, view of the mountains. But Hafen was down in Springville, Utah. And in Springville, Utah, uh, right at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Springville High School uh, began to uh, collect art and show it to their students and to encourage them uh, to uh, take an interest in the visual arts. And the person behind this, her name was Alice Merrill Horn. Has anyone heard of Alice uh, Merrill Horn? She was a state uh, uh, legislator uh, in the Utah uh, House. And she um, sponsored legislation that started the Utah Arts Council in 1898. This is the first Arts Council in the United States, and it's here in Utah. And the purpose of the Utah Arts Council was to encourage artists to give them actual small grants to uh, purchase materials necessary to paint. That's about it, but it, it allowed them to, to do what they love to do. And uh, it encouraged them. And so, the, pl the question is, you know, where would you put this art once it's painted? And in Utah, uh, the Springville Museum, uh, the Springville uh, High School, uh, took the lead in uh, having these artists work hang in the uh, high school. This began a tradition of artists in Utah painting uh, and hanging their works of art uh, in, um, in the schools, in the public schools. Now, I don't know how many of you went, to, you had your public high school education in Utah, but can any of you remember having original works of art in your uh, school? Bill, did you? Davis high school. Yeah, Davis High School, West High School. Uh, in fact, West, uh, I had a chance to teach a class in the honors program at the University of Utah, and uh, one of the projects of the students uh, was to uh, put together uh, an exhibit uh, on Utah art and to think about the audience and to think about who would come. And one of the one of the student groups chose West High School as uh, the uh, focus of their uh, work, and so they went to the West High School. Uh, they opened. You know, there were wa works still hanging, but there's works in the back, you know, uh, in, in the theater department, you know, sort of lined up against the wall, you know, and uh, in any event, there are 10,000 works of original art in the elementary and high schools of Utah. And uh, wouldn't you know that the that the organization that cataloged this is the Spring now the Springville Museum of Art, which was the uh, which uh, grew out of that original uh, Springville 
uh, high school and uh, they're the ones that chronicled this and, uh, and uh, have, have done appraisals. And so the works of art in the Utah schools are estimated at a, a value of about $20 million. So um, this is a heritage of visual arts. Now in Alice Merrill Horn's view, art was to inspire, you know, to lift your, your, yourself uh, and, and, and improve your moral character. And uh, so uh, l uh, looking out on the mountains, uh, thinking about God's creation uh, and so forth was a part of, you know, w should be a part of a young person's education. So we have then uh, John Hafen, we have several examples here of artists who uh, uh, painted uh, and their works, uh, 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 some of their works ended up in the, in the high, sc high schools or elementary schools. And one last um, note on this, in the elementary school, uh, the, the children would uh, come to school with pennies uh, to put in a jar uh, for uh, the painters. So uh, when they got enough pennies in a jar, uh, they could uh, uh, ask, uh, uh, a local uh, painter like Edwin Evans, for example, down in, uh, uh, in uh, Utah Valley uh, to do another painting uh, that would hang in, uh, you know, the high schools uh, uh, down there. So isn't that interesting? To me, uh, this was a world that was opened up to me as we uh, got together and chose the very uh, different images uh, for, uh, for the book. So what we were trying to do uh, was a simple, as I mentioned, a simple concept that the Hudson River School goes west. And Bob and I worked uh, on the essay. One critical person to this effort was Ann Orton, who's another author on the book. She, uh, she was important to our project in many ways. First of all, Bob and I would get together around uh, our dining room table uh, in uh, the avenues with all of these images laid out on the table and saying, you know, I think this one should go in, no, not this one, and I think this, or why, you know, what was the significance of all of that? And Anne would say, uh, I'm in the presence of two master digressors. <laughs> You know, and uh, you know, we got to get this job done. You know, and uh, so she was, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, just terrific in that way. But she also, uh, because of her uh, work, um, knew um, uh, many private collectors that held works that are that you see here from private collections uh, that uh, nobody knew existed. And so one of the great things about the book is it's brought to light paintings uh, that uh, otherwise would be in, you know, in private collections that would not be known. So I think that's a tremendous uh, contribution. Uh, and uh, so uh, we worked as a, uh, a trio uh, you know, on the book. As we did, uh, and we, as we worked with Gibbs Smith, uh, it came together. Uh, the book was then uh, uh, sent to uh, uh, once, it, once all the images were digitized and we were happy with what we saw, we sent uh, the book to Hong Kong where it was uh, printed and then, uh, and then shipped back. And, uh, and so the book arrived on a Wednesday. They actually flew just a few books. The others were still on a boat. And I took them into Bob Alpin's office and Alpin's offices just the archetypal academic, you know, stacks and stacks of things. I said, Bob, are you in there? <laughs> and, uh, you know, you go around and through and, you know, he'd pull some things away. Hey, Tom. And I said, I've got the book, i got the book. Where are we going to put it? Uh, but in any event, we looked at it. He was so delighted with the book. Uh, and then, sadly, uh, that was a Wednesday. On Friday, he had a stroke. Uh, and the following week he passed away. So uh, this was, uh, you know, a shock. And, uh, but it was a dream fulfilled for him uh, to uh, see, the, see the book completed uh, and to put a, in my view, 
an important uh, exclamation point on uh, th his writing and uh, and uh, we benefit from that so much because as you read the essay in the book you you find it has a lively pitch to it you know and even though I was arguing with him about some of the academic uh, arguments that we were making in the book for the for the um, Hudson River School going west and and finding images you know in all sorts of places at Yale and uh, uh, and, and tracking them down. Uh, you know, he always had great humor about it and always wanted to make sure that anyone who picked up that essay would have fun reading it and not just uh, feel like they were, uh, you know, being subjected to an academic, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, opine. And so, uh, so uh, in any event, that uh, kind of puts the, uh, the, the point on that. So the other thing I wanted to talk about tonight is how paintings um, are um, a window. Uh, and uh, they're, uh, so if you think of the, uh, of the frame, framing a window to the world, uh, and think about how these artists uh, visualize their world, you can see all the different competing views, all the different ways that uh, these mountains can be seen, and you can also see how that developed over time and how there's really no end in sight to uh, the way artists can depict the subject matter. So while we had to end it in 2005, uh, when we first published the book, there's still artists uh, that continue to paint and paint creatively uh, images of the uh, Wasatch Mountains. But when you sort of start to look at this in terms of a chronological view, and you see uh, next to, to, to Haven, J.T. Harwood, uh, a painting of Black Rock, and with the mountains in the background, you know, that painting is talking uh, about a popular place where uh, people uh, in the city would congregate at Black Rock. You know, they in fact had a, a trolley that went out there, and people would picnic, and they would lay, you know, go out into the water and float and, you know, all these various things that happened at the lake. It was a, it was a place for people to congregate. And there in the background are, you know, the Wasatch. And so uh, J.T. Harwood was so important because he, you know, he lived right here. He had a number of artists that, that uh, he inspired, uh, many of those going to Europe and getting uh, trained and educated in, in, uh, in art and coming back and then painting in the new style, uh, which was uh, by then, you know, uh, a form of Impressionism. And uh, as you look around, you can see uh, the uh, influence of, the, uh, of, of Impressionism and Expressionism that we'll, we'll talk about. But Bierstadt was one of the first to, uh, you know, have uh, an influence on painters in the valley. And uh, right back here, this painting uh, by Colmer, uh, is fantastic uh, view, uh, you know, here's Tom with a steady hand, but you can see a kind of theatrical, here it's stage, it's almost like a stage design, isn't it? With uh, uh, the trees on the left, the rocks on the right, and then looking out into the distance and with the mountains in the distance. This is a very uh, academic approach, with serpentine line out into the distance, uh, but done with such great uh, uh, ability, you know, that is in the certainly in the tradition of those painters who painted the Hudson Valley, Valley. and so it's not hard to make a visual connection between our argument uh, and uh, and this uh, uh, painting. On the other side of the wall here is another of uh, Colmer's painting of um, in watercolor. So this one is in oil, and the, and uh, and then he has another in watercolor. These are the two. Uh, while well, other media were, were certainly applied, acrylic and, uh, and other types of media, uh, oil and watercolor are the two primary media that were used by artists to depict um, the Wasatch Mountains. And so we, we can talk about, uh, you know, what that media can do, how it uh, gives a richness uh, to uh, the subject matter, uh, as we go along, certainly I'd be happy to answer questions about it. So then, um, 
we kind of fast forward to uh, another watercolor here by uh, Rebecca Livermore, where you have you know the foothills here, you have the valley, and you have the mountains. Uh, it's the same as you have back in the back uh, with Comer, but you can see that the city now is uh, you know filled in. Uh, but still, the mountains are strong uh, subject matter for uh, you know a, a local view. Um, I love Allison Willingham. Alison Willingham's uh, painting here, where um, where we have a, a, a clearly an expressionistic approach to her subject matter, with the mountains, yes, in the background and sort of part of the backdrop. Clearly, for her, uh, the the barn is the subject matter, uh, but uh, it's all sort of within. Uh, the uh, shadow of, of the mountains. And so we tried to, in the book, uh, not just have uh, pictures of the mountains alone, but we hoped that as people looked at the book and went through it, they would see a kind of uh, connection to uh, 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 life in Utah. And uh, certainly this painting of hers uh, is just alive with a subjective uh, view. Her thick impasto approach to painting is, uh, you know, something that we all know from having ever seen a Van Gogh painting, and uh, this same, you know, kind of approach to the painting, which is her subjective uh, depiction of this uh, barn. I just think is uh, really lush. Uh, the colors just pop off the canvas for me. I think it's a, she's a wonderful colorist. Uh, she has a real sense of texture. And uh, so this is uh, a, a, another in that, uh, you know, a, a tradition of, uh, of uh, oil painting. And then behind me uh, are paintings by uh, Susan, Susan Schwartz. And uh, this painting of uh, the Aspen Grove is um, a really uh, a, a kind of a, a modern uh, view, uh, but it um, also captures her, uh, 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 her philosophy, uh, essentially her cosmology, which is that uh, there's a spirituality associated with these mountains. And I think that's something that so many of us can relate to. I mean, I think many of us have found in the mountains a place of consolation, a place of meditation, a place where, uh, uh, of excitement, uh, you know, I'm Mr. Mountain Biker here, I love uh, the mountains for that. But uh, in terms of, uh, you know, finding a kind of spiritual connection, uh, you know, in the mountains, uh, are, is something that's ubiquitous. It's, it's over time been important to people. You can read in their journals uh, how uh, the mountains come alive uh, from, from that point of view. And for her, this aspen grove, which has now been brought to the surface of the painting, and is really an abstraction, uh, uh, is, is kind of a veil uh, into which we can kind of see almost like a Rothko kind of idea of, of seeing through the surface of the paint into something uh, behind it that's uh, even more significant than the veil itself. Does that make sense? And uh, so she has captured that uh, uh, being a, a person here in Park City uh, who is an advocate for uh, the arts and certainly a big supporter of, of your work, right, uh, Robin? Uh, it's very fitting um, uh, and for me it was a special opportunity uh, to visit with her in her studio uh, several years ago to have her talk about her work and there are works of hers in the book although the works you see here tonight are not in the book these are the two that are not actually in the book but she has other paintings represented in the book uh, she uh, it was great to go to her studio it was great to see uh, a, a woman who uh, just can't wait to um, uh, paint and paints 
from a kind of spiritual conviction. And uh, many artists uh, have this approach to their art in one way or another, and it may be more on the aesthetic spectrum than it is on, uh, on any uh, other kind of spectrum. But uh, it's uh, an important gift, uh, I think, that she's uh, uh, been given and something that helps all of us uh, you know, contemplate. So when you look through the, the frame and out into the world, what kind of world do you see? You know, and how do you think about the world? And how is it colored for you? Uh, and how would you color that world uh, if uh, you had a chance to paint uh, this, uh, these kinds of images? And I just uh, uh, bring to your attention uh, some of the paintings that are like LeConte Stewart over here was someone who was committed to painting uh, rural Utah and remained, you know, very committed to that. Although he has a wide uh, spectrum of art, and uh, if any of you had a chance to see the exhibit at the University of Utah recently on his work, you could see how broad it is. A, a lavish book that was done uh, on LeConte Stewart, uh, and then we have uh, over here uh, this wonderful painting. The thing that I like about that painting is that, as you can see, it's painted out onto the frame. And so, some, you know, so some of us take that window frame for granted, right? And we're just looking out. We're not looking at, around it. For him, uh, he's saying, this is a painting. And my worldview extends completely across the canvas and into the world that I live, including the, uh, including the uh, frame of, of uh, of my of view. So it's sort of all encompassing. Um, there's a painting back here by Waldo Midgley. I love this painting of Park City, one of my favorites in the collection. Waldo Midgley was uh, uh, studied art in New York. He's had, uh, he, he knew a lot of the uh, Ashcan School of Painters uh, and uh, they helped him, uh, I think, think about the sort of uh, uh, the life that exists at the base of the mountains. And so with Waldo Midgley, you have a, a world there in 1924 of mining and of the various uh, uh, elements of, of uh, minor act, miners' activities and uh, mining, which was at that time still important uh, to uh, Utah. Uh, and then would give way to tourism uh, later in the century. And then finally, uh, we have Maynard Dixon. Uh, Maynard Dixon is here, a very, uh, and, and we debated having Maynard Dixon in the book, uh, but we thought it was uh, partly, uh, he did paint sort of the foothills at the bottom of the Wasatch. So the Wasatch extends from Box Elder down past Nebo into the plateau, you know, into the and that's where uh, paintings uh, by Maynard Dixon, uh, you know, start from a geographical standpoint. And uh, but we we said, yeah, let's put uh, a couple of uh, of uh, works uh, by Maynard Dixon in the book. But more as sort of a challenge uh, that another book needs to be written, uh, a book uh, you know on the Red Rock country and the country south of of here in the Red Rock. And sure enough, uh, Donna Poulton and, uh, and Vern Swanson and others uh, did that book. Uh, and it, I think, is, uh, a, to me, it, it's really great to see this subject matter uh, continue to be uh, uh, focused on as uh, important to uh, our identity, our visual identity uh, in Utah. Uh, so that's kind of the a final thought that there's still many different subject matters that uh, could be uh, approached and uh, we we certainly have the Red Rock as uh, the newest uh, you know uh, book on that uh, but the Wasatch Mountains uh, uh, book uh, has been uh, uh, sold out uh, there are a few copies I guess uh, left but uh, uh, it's uh, 
It was a privilege to work with Bob and Ann on the project. I'm grateful that you could be here tonight to, to hear a little bit about uh, the story of how that came to be and uh, to, to uh, participate in this uh, glimpse of uh, cultural history in, in Utah. So uh, thank you very much. And